the wound that was in the back was not a fatal one. So I you did. held John yeah. F. Kennedy's brain? Yes. Well, I assume it was John F. Kennedy's brain. When the body first came in and you saw it, did you notice anything out of the ordinary? There's a portion of the brain here that was missing. There was an incision in the scalp. Why the, would there be an incision? That's a good question. The throat wound probably would have come from... Over the bridge? Probably right, right off of the railroad. What's your opinion on Lyndon Johnson? Who were the two people that benefited the most? Him and... So look, if the topic of JFK assassination intrigues you, you're gonna love today's interview. Here's why. Obviously, I've had other people on Valuetainment before with Clint Hill, who was a former Secret Service agent. He was the first agent that jumped on the car when John F. Kennedy was shot. We've also had Abraham Bolden, who was the first African-American Secret Service agent. But today we go a completely different angle. Uh, today, I wanted to sit down with somebody, and this is very rare because it's been 55 years since the event, uh, the assassination, November 22nd, uh, 1963. When the autopsy happened, there were four people in the room who did the autopsy. He is one of them, and during the autopsy, three people held the brain. This is why we have the brain here. He held the brain, he was one of them. And he saw some stuff that's gonna surprise you. And we're talking about somebody that witnessed what he saw in the brain that's different than maybe what you've read about. And so we're gonna take a deep, deep dive today on what happened from the moment the body was announced dead to the delivery to Air Force One, from there to Potesta, did the casket go with Jackie? Did it go with somebody else? What happened there? All I can tell you is I'm gonna ask one question during this interview that I'm so curious with the answer, and we're gonna see what Jim Jenkins is gonna tell us today in this interview. With that being said, Jim, thank you so much for coming down and being willing to open up and talk about this topic with well, us. Thank you for inviting. You're documented all over the place. If you go read any of the, you know, the autopsies, any of the reports, whether it's the Warren Commission, whatever the reports you read, you're, you're documented there as somebody that was a part of it. But you've not wanted to come out and talk a lot about it. Now, obviously, William, a friend of yours who decided to write a book with you, mm -hmm. kind of maybe persuaded you to say, this is a story we need to go tell. Are you willing to do it? But uh, first, I want to thank you. Secondly, uh, is I'd want to kind of uh, get some thoughts from you on what caused you to not want to talk about it all, this year, all these years, and why now are you a little bit more comfortable? I have to answer the people who ask me. It's like, you know, if I had told you when I was in graduate school that I did the autopsy on JFK, would you have believed me? And I, that's kind of the way that I look at it. Was a part of it the fact that you didn't think people would believe you uh, if you told them that? Because if we were friends, let's just say I'm your friend and I'm your best man at your wedding or you're my best man at my wedding and you told me something like that, I'd be like, oh my gosh, Jim, that's crazy. To really tell me about it. I'd want to know more as a friend on what you did. Uh, you seem like a private guy. You seem like a simple man. You don't seem like a, you know, you seem like you just want to, you've been married since August of 63. Was there also part of it where you just didn't want people to have a certain level of intrusion in your personal life? I think a lot of it was that. Okay. There's a lot of memories that I have in that book that are specific, but there are other things in the book that I remember that I've tried to, you know, I tried to tie in some of the events. When I first began this book, I was going to read, and, and I have all kinds of books. I have a bookcase of, of books that people have sent me over the years. I haven't read them. I'm from Iran, so mm -hmm. I was born in Iran. I saw right. the war. I saw people dying. I, I, I saw things that happened that maybe you don't necessarily want to experience. I saw some weird scenes in my life with 10,000 men flagellating their backs on the streets and there's yeah. a streak of blood. I mean, I was eight years old when I saw that. That's not something I want to see again, right? Was this one of those things where you said, man, this was so traumatic on me that I don't ever want to revisit it, or was it the fact that you were just doing your job, you have a lack of interest on the topic? Like, honestly, you know, it just so happened I accidentally was chosen to be a part of this. I didn't choose to be a part of this. I was just doing my job. Which one would you say was more I you? think the latter. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, this is not a, you know, it's just not a highlight of my life. It hasn't affected my life at all, but I think that's because I really am not participated in it. What's the reasoning though? Paul O'Connor was the other 
Corman. Corman. Right. Mm -hmm. and by the way, just to say, when you say the other Corman, the other Corman who was part of the autopsy. Right. There were two of us. There was two of them. There were only yes. two of us. Paul enjoyed this, you know, being involved in that type of thing. I had other goals in my life. Most of the participation that I have done was at the encouragement of Paul. Paul would call me and say, well, you know, this individual wants, wants to interview you. I would be hesitant about it, and he'd say, well, and Paul would tell me, well, he's a good guy. But it was, it was a reluctance on my part. You know, I didn't want to get involved in all of what was going on. Is this after the two gentlemen who were kind of hostile to you with the HSCA committee that they interviewed you? Even after that, you were open to it or after you're like, I'm not doing any interviews? Well, the interview was interesting. I was in graduate school at that time. I was in my office and I got a call from a lady and she told me that these two individuals, uh, Kelly and Purdy, were going to show up at my house on such and such date at such and such time. And they were going to talk to me about my participation in, in the autopsy. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not going to come to my house. I don't know you. You're strangers. So then she told me that this was a Congress-mandated commission and that I w was compelled to do this or they would subpoena me. At that time, I was at Jackson, Mississippi in, in the medical school there. And so I went to my... Uh, local congressman, one of his aides checked to make sure that this was legitimate, and he suggested that I meet in his office. So I met Purdy and Kelly in his office. It wasn't an amiable type situation. They had told me that, that Purdy and Kelly were actually lawyers for the House Select Committee and where they were going to come to take a deposition. Well, when the secretary for the congressman check their credentials, we found out that indeed Purdy was an attorney, but Kelly was an FBI agent. What were they trying to get from you though? I mean, what did they, were they conspiracy, conspiratory side or were they trying to? They basically were looking for a confirmation of the Warren Commission findings. They wanted me to confirm. That the magic bullet was correct. Yeah, yeah, and, and the single bullet theory was correct. and. Uh, they never really asked me, you know, basically what, what I did, uh, what I saw, or uh, what I participated in. And every time I would, uh, they, would, they were always saying, well, that can't possibly happen because of this, this, and this. And they'd say, well, you know, I don't, another witness has said this. There, were, there was only the doctors and Paul, so I knew that, you know, what they were saying came from from one of those individuals. And this was... And you knew that in a moment based on the questioning. Yeah. Because see, I, I, until Paul called me and, and talked to me about this interview, it, or this deposition, uh, I really had never discussed the autopsy with Paul. And uh, So wait a minute, so after the autopsy, you and Paul didn't have a debrief, you guys didn't talk about it, nothing ever? Oh no, no, because we were given orders you know, we were given orders by the Secretary uh, of the Navy and also by uh, the Department of Defense not to uh, discuss it. So, so the only reason you were open to the House Committee coming to you is because it's coming from Congress? Well, so that you you're plus, open to it. plus that was the first time they rescinded the orders. Got it. Uh, we, they sent us letters rescinding the orders. When they interviewed you, did, did you get a feeling that they were for what the Warren Commission came out and the results, that's what they said, or were they against it to try to get conspiracy? Were they kind of trying to get the check mark from you to say that he also agrees that what they said in the Warren Commission is accurate? I, th I believe that's, I mean, okay. that was my, my feeling. Did you watch JFK movies? Did you watch no. the interview? Did you no. watch anything? So you didn't, no. till today, you don't, you don't watch or follow any of this. No. You've never been to the Dealey Plaza before. No. For 55 years, you have fully disconnected that part of your life to not have to be tied to it. I was actually surprised about the passionate interest that people had in this after 50 years. Uh, you were surprised by that? Oh, yes. Why would you be surprised by it? It's a president I, that was assassinated. Uh, well, I mean, the assassination to me is such an enigma in that it's never had a legal conclusion. 
the conclusion has always been political. Would you want to see a legal conclusion? Yes, I'd like to see. Would a you legal. participate in a legal conclusion? Yes. Oh, so you would be. Yeah. So you, so it's not the fact that you're just trying to set it aside, and not do anything with it. So you would be, you would like to see, like you know, when I think it was 1995 when they came out with the ARRB when they came out right. and they wanted to reinvestigate and find out what's going on and they went through certain things, you would want to see somebody else open it up again to go through an investigation to find out what happened? A legal investigation. I know, not political, not a legal political, investigation. Legal. But everything, uh, even, even the uh, Record Review Board, which is what you're speaking of, uh, it had restrictions when the Clark Commission was there. All of the people appointed to the Clark Commission had ties to the government. They had obligations to the government. Uh, the pathologists that reviewed the case and so forth uh, are the doctors. I'm not sure all of them were pathologists, but they had ties to the doctors. Uh, they had grants. They were participating in federal projects and that mm -hmm. type of stuff. And the ones that probably would have been uh, more objective, uh, certainly people like Dr. Sarah Weck, after the House Select, they were, they were kind of excluded. They were, they were all pushed away. So there's never, in my, in my mind, in my opinion, there's never been a real objective committee or anything that's delved into this. Why do you think? Why? Is it because if we found that we would all be... Well, I think that we, that, that gets into some things. And, and I'm only judging, I can only judge by the autopsy. And, and there are vastly more people out there that know more about any, anything outside that morgue than I do. But I, I, it just doesn't make sense that what we saw at the morgue, what we did at the morgue, and what I participated in, uh, like the brain, mm -hmm. you know, there were two FBI agents that said there was no brain. Uh, Paul said there was no brain. Uh, but yet, Dr. Humes took a brain out of the cranium, handed it to Dr. Boswell. Dr. Boswell and I went over, and I knelt down, and he gave me the, the brain. I turned it upside down and put it in the sling. You did? So I you did. held John yeah. F. Kennedy's brain? Yes. Well, I assume it was John F. Kennedy's brain. Well, that's one other part, right? So Right. And what... You know, as the book describes in, in that, I don't know if it, I've been asked many times, is it, was it John F. Kennedy's brain? Do you think it was? I have I really don't have any, any way of knowing and neither does anyone else unless somebody who, who really participated in, in, you know, uh, covering uh, up some parts of the assassination can come forth and say. Now, I'm also pessimistic in that since there's so much stuff that's come out that if I relate it back to what I saw and so forth, there's always a question about it. It sounds like you believe it's important for us to know the truth on what happened, but you also believe that if it's a government investigation being done, whoever's in, involved on the inside, if it's only the government controlling it, not on the other side, we're only going to get the answer from somebody's on the inside. Well, for instance, I've worked with a friend of mine uh, who's a neurologist. I've tried to be allowed to go into the archives and review the, the photographs and, and the evidence that they have there. I've been denied, but yet he, he was allowed in and to see the x-rays and so forth. Now, those x-rays I participated in. I actually helped uh, position the, the body and so forth and on the first set of x-rays that we did. I remember the, f the first photographs when the head was first unwrapped. They took photographs all during the autopsy and I was busy so I really w wasn't paying much attention to that. But, but the photographs from the, the Fox photographs uh, they're strange. But let me ask you this, because you said you, you didn't have interest, but why were you asking to want to get the photographs? It, was there a moment where you kind of felt obligated to want to find out again some answers? Because well, it sounds like there's a little bit of conflicted, uh, the, the willingness, the desire, and also at the same time wanting to stay away. Three years ago, I committed to this, to writing this book. And 
all of this has occurred within that time frame. So you asked for the photographs in the last three years? Oh, yeah. So uh, your desire to want to go deeper on this is the last three years? Well, uh, I have talked to, like I said, a friend of mine, the neurologist, and he, he and I have discussed what he saw in the archives and what I remember seeing, uh, or what I actually participated in and remember seeing. We've come to some conclusions, but not really things that I would consider to be emphatically true, okay? As far as participating in this, three years ago when I, when I finally agreed to do this, if William would, would furnish, because I'm basically been in, in medicine and science, and I'm not a journalist or a writer, and he agreed to, to help with it. Then his first suggestion was that I need to start reading the material. I started a couple of books, but then I began to realize that if I read all of this material, then I may have a little brain melt, you know, and it might come in because, you know, 50 year old memories are, are difficult enough to begin with. So I stopped doing that. And then I began to talk to the people that I knew were at Bethesda, not necessarily in the morgue, but were at Bethesda. And then I, I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to uh, the um, honor guard people, a gentleman named Dennis David, who was in charge of a uh, detail that actually... He was an E6 who became an officer later right. on, and he served mm -hmm. for 11 years, I think. Right. Yeah. What did he tell you when you spoke to him? Well, he, he and I talked about the uh, unloading of the body from, from the Black Hearse. Dennis gave me more of a time frame than anything else because I was in the morgue actually from about 3.30 in the afternoon to about 8, 9 o'clock the next morning. You knew the body was coming? Uh, we were told the body was coming, yes. Would you mind us going through the, the, the timeline of what happened from the moment they found out he's dead to the moment, because that's, that's where the challenge is with this story, right? I mean, you did right. the autopsy stuff, yeah. but the challenge for me when I look at it, I'm a numbers guy. So first they find out he's dead. Boom, check mark. Then they say, let's put his body, they wrap him up in a nice, they put him in a really nice casket. They take him to Air Force One. That's mm -hmm. number two. Lyndon Johnson's waiting there rather than going back to D.C. to have the body being delivered to the plane, which is kind of a little bit wild for that. Gets to Air Force One. Then they fly back to Bethesda, D.C. They land, they take that nice casket and they put it in the automobile that Jackie right. Kennedy is riding in to go to where you're at, the morgue. They arrive actually at 7.30, but the body doesn't come in 7.17. And the body doesn't come until 8. And the challenge that I'm seeing there is another automobile delivers a casket that's used for Vietnam veterans back in the day. It's just a mm -hmm. cheapy type of casket. Right that apparently they took John F. Kennedy and they put him in a body bag and they put him there. And that was uh, brought to you guys at around 6, 6.30 six, and you had an hour yeah. and a half before 8 o'clock. So that's the part that's conflicting well, here. See, and, that, and again, too, I, I really don't have any insight into that either. But the I, report, you but, read the Bojian report and, and yeah. all of that, the numbers, uh, him and Dennis David's timing. And see, and this, I had to have a timeline for this. Uh, as I was writing it. I had no personal timeline because, you know, all I saw uh, was the body being brought in in what I considered to be a shipping casket. Uh, that was striking in the fact is that it was the president's body in that, in that such a ordinary plane. You saw that? Yes, yes, I you did. You saw the shipping casket? Yes, I did. And that's not typical protocol to put a president under shipping casket. I wouldn't think so. You witnessed that yourself. Yes, so I check, saw. Check mark not time, but you saw that part. Yeah, the casket came in. It was brought in by uh, by people. Uh, they were in uh, business suits, and there may have been a couple of military officers with it. But they were brought. It was brought in, and it was uh, brought into the morgue proper, sat down on the floor. Paul helped them take the body out and they put the body on the table in front of me. Now, I've used, I'm used, I used Dennis Davis' timeline. And I use it because uh, Sergeant Borgens 
action report stated 635. Several years ago, we talked to an individual, his name was, uh, well, he was Dr. J. Uh, Scott, I believe. And he's told us that he was the officer of the day for the Bethesda Hospital. During the conversation with, with William Law, William asked him what time the, the, the body came in, and he immediately said 6.30. So I took Sergeant Boyden and Dr. Scott as collaboration for the time uh, that Dennis quoted. And then I used that time as a, line, as a timeline for the autopsy. Uh, at that point in time, I had memories, but I, I wasn't quite sure of sequencing of them. And then over the three years that I've been writing this book, I, I basically just write sections and certain things and so forth, and then each section will, will begin to support or ask or create questions about that particular memory. The timeline that I use, like I said, is, is Dennis's. Uh, that timeline gave me the ability to say the body was here at 6.30. When, when the body was put on the table, everybody was asked to leave. The body was still was on the table, still wrapped into sheets. The head and the body was separate. And then Dr. Boswell left the morgue for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes maybe. And I just assumed he was going back up to the laboratory to, you know, talk to Dr. Humes and while the body's in front of you? Yeah, the body's in the morgue, in the morgue with Paul and I. And this is what time? I assumed that that had to be somewhere between uh, 6.30 and 7 o'clock. If I say it took him approximately 10 minutes to uh, unload the body from the hearse and bring it to, to that. Because, see, uh, Dennis and his, his group or his, his crew, they did not bring it into the morgue. They brought it to the morgue door, according to Dennis, and then someone from the back. Yeah, and somebody took it from there. Uh, the morgue was set up where there was a little ante room that had coal boxes where we would put the bodies to me, and then then it came into the morgue proper. So let me ask you: from the moment it was delivered to the morgue from the back, not the one with Jackie Kennedy that arrived around 7:30 to 8 o'clock. I'm talking the one that arrived early from that moment where it showed up in that cheap casket to the moment where you saw it, what was that timeline? I would say probably no more than five minutes. Okay. Because you just was unloaded onto the, to the dock and then brought into the, into the double doors and then morgues to, immediately to the left. As soon as it came through the door from the ante room, then I saw the casket. And that's when I, that's what I remember. And the reason I remember that is the fact is that it was such a plain casket, you know, and, and that, that struck me as being that the president's body would be in a, in a uh, transport casket. Now this entire time Jackie's thinking the body's in the ornate casket that she is driving in, that that's the I, one that's being delivered. I, I really, on my part, that would be conjecture or speculation. Got it. And uh, I'm not comfortable with that. We're getting into that. Let's come back to when the body came in. When the body first came in and you saw it, did you notice anything out of the ordinary? The body was uh, was wrapped, you know, the head was wrapped in sheets and the body was wrapped separately in sheets. The body was taken out of the casket. The morgue had two tables. We did the autopsy on the table where I was. The casket, the body was actually taken out between the back table and it was on the floor and it was put on the table in front of me. At that time, Dr. Boswell thanked everybody and asked them to leave, and everyone left the morgue. Then Dr. Boswell left, and Paul and I were there. We, we, we were told not to unwrap the body and not to let anyone in the morgue. And about 15 minutes, uh, I'd say about 15 minutes later, Dr. Boswell came back, and uh, we, un we unwrapped the, uh, the body, we left the head wrapped, and then uh, we spread a sheet over from the waist down, and then Dr. Boswell handed me the clipboard, what we call a face sheet. It's a form where you put all scars, uh, wounds, any uh, surgical, traumatic, whatever. It's basically a, a superficial description of everything on 
before you go to the body. We were doing that. As we were doing that, uh, I was writing down on what Dr. Basel was was telling me. It's It was a little unusual to be doing it that way. It was usually the other way around. And while we were doing that, just almost when we were finished, Dr. Humes came in and he had a, he was followed by, I believe, three or four military officers. They were they were flag grade, in other words, they were admirals or, or generals. Got it. The officers went into the gallery. Dr. Humes came to the table. I'm not exactly sure when Dr. Fink came in. Uh, he, was, he was there when Humes unwrapped the head. That's kind of con contradictory to what he says. I mean, his report to, to uh, his commanding officer, which he said he didn't come in until the brain, the heart, and the lungs were out of the body. When Dr. Humes, he unwrapped the head, he and, and Dr. Fink examined the head. and that, Right in front of you? Oh, yeah. I, well, I'm standing at the shoulder. I'm standing at the right shoulder of the president, looking down like that. And at this point, how many autopsies have you done yourself up to this point? And how many brains have you seen? Oh, I don't know. We, uh, when I started... I, you know, it was married in August. Uh, we went immediately to Bethesda. I started doing in my duty. I was a student there. I had classes and so forth. But every fourth night I had duty, and we would do two, maybe three autopsies a night. So I, I really don't know how many I had done. So you've seen a number of different yeah, I, wounded brains. You've seen a, a different scenarios. Most of the things that we did at, at Bethesda were actually patients from the hospital. I remember only probably one other trauma that I remember is that a sailor had a night out and hit a concrete barrier. Most of the others were people who had died from that. We had drownings from Annapolis. Had you seen any other shooting? Like had you done an autopsy where there was a... I, no, I had not. Got it. No. So um, while you're looking at Fink and Humes doing what they're doing, what, what, what did you notice? Did you see anything different? You know, the description of the head wound that is in the autopsy report, hesitate to use the word spin, but I think it's a spin on what, what we really saw. Could you elaborate, please? Uh, well, it's actually the size of the wound, uh, location of the wound. I believe that the measurement that's in the autopsy report actually is the measurement of the wound, not of the opening where the bone and scalp was missing, but actually was a measurement of the total uh, wound shown after the scalp was reflected. And in other words, the whole right side of the head was malleable. You could actually just move it around with your hands. The skull was fractured in multiple uh, areas from... Would you uh, mind if we take out the brain yeah, and you sure. kind of show it to us what you, what you mean by that a little yeah, bit more visual? Sure. Is that okay with you? Okay. Now, the description of the wound is not going to be... This is not going to give you a description of, of, the, of the wound itself. It's only going to be the skull. The skull is going to give you the description yes. of the wound. This will will give you an idea of what I saw the brain look like as opposed to the extensive damage that w was in the autopsy report. And uh, this brain, the brain that, that I had, the, uh, this should be about here. It's, the damage for this brain was basically in this area here. That's what you saw? Yeah. Okay. There's a portion of the brain here that that was missing. Fully missing? Yeah. Okay. It, but it was, it was less than a third of the total brain. Less than a third of the total brain or less than a third of half the brain? No. The, the right side of no, the brain? No, it was less than a third of the total brain. Got it. it. Okay. It was approximately an area right here. Got it. Okay. That's significant because in the autopsy report, they say that over half or of the total brain was, was missing. The other thing in the autopsy report, they say that there was a deep laceration that ran this way and was internally down into the ventricles here. Uh, and then also in here, they had a description of 
it penetrating into to this area here. Now, the wound that I saw, this is the occipital area mm -hmm. here and the parietal area here, and then the temporal area in the, in the here. The wound was here, about approximately where my finger is, and it extending down here. It was about three and a half inches long, this being the length, about two inches wide. That was where the missing bone was and the missing tissue was, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't exactly a square or a round mm -hmm. thing. The top of it, of the wound was kind of domed and it came down and it kind of had a little uh, tail type thing that came back down into here and then it kind of came back up in this area. Now, the strange thing about it was at this top of the wound here, there was an incision in the scalp that went approximately to the coronal suture here. It went a little bit past here. An incision? An incision. That well, you saw? Right. It was actually, see... Why the, would there be an incision? That's a good question. The scalp had, you know, remember all of this, all of this, this portion in this area is fractured, okay? to the sagittal suture, which is this, this suture. All of this area was fractured now, but it, was, it wasn't gone. It was, it was still being kept intact by the, by the scalp. The scalp had rents and tears in it. And along this area, it, it seemed like that some of those tears in the scalp had been surgically connected. The little connections to follow a uh, fracture line in here, okay, and that extended to about here, okay. You know that was the same when, when Dr. Humes took the wrappings off of the head. There was a secondary wrapping on it that I, I you know, I think was the towel. But the scalp and and the whole thing had this was all all matted hair and missing scalp, torn scalp, fatty tissue from underneath the scalp. Which is all normal. Yeah, which is all normal, okay. It had kind of stuck to that secondary layer. So as he was taking it off, this area kind of gapped open. But as soon as we separated it from the, from the uh, towel, it went back together. Now, that's, that's significant for, uh, for the fact is that you could actually, if, if you wanted to do that, you could actually lay this skull open. You could actually take your hands and separate it. Okay. So that would have given you access to the brain. Which means? Which, again, speculation. Sure. Is that fact is that, that you would have had access, you possibly had access to the brain before we received it in the, in the morgue. But where would they? That is, that's a question that I would Air like. Air Force One on the drive? That's not enough time. Would it be? Well, I don't, there's a lot of uh, theories. There's a lot of probabilities. Last year, uh, I have friends that were in school with me and, and, and I visited one of the friends in D.C. And just out of curiosity, uh, William Law and I, we actually went to visit Glen Cove. Annex. It was given to uh, the military and before World War I. Uh, it was under uh, Walter Reed. Walter Reed was responsible for it. They used it for uh, convalescence for World War I and World War II patients and so forth. So I wanted to check out that because there was an individual uh, had speculated, he said that surgery was done, clandestine surgery, surgery was done at, at this Glen Cove. Annex. And so we decided to see if it was possible. We drove to the complex, drove back to the back gate uh, at Bethesda. Uh, it was eight minutes, uh, GPS. The funeral home that was involved in it was Gawler's. Uh, we actually timed the distance from Gawler's funeral home to Bethesda, which again was about eight minutes. Now, in Recently, we found that there may have been another funeral home that was involved in it, Pumphrey's. Uh, Pumphrey's supposedly had the uh, 
contract with Bethesda Naval Hospital at that time. Uh, understand, I, uh, my command was not in the Naval Hospital. My command was the Naval Medical School there. There's also a possibility that the person, uh, Tom Robinson, who performed, who actually prepared the body along with a couple of other people, was not an employee of Gawler's, he was an employee of Pumphrey's. Uh, we haven't been able to confirm that. Uh, I've tried in the last three years to get in touch with Tom Robinson, uh, not been able to do that. What would be the difference if that was the case? Say uh, it is. Well, I read an interview of Tom with a Swedish uh, or Danish uh, researcher. Tom's description of the wounds and so forth are similar to mine and almost uh, opposite of what's in, you know, what, what's being told in public and so forth. The exaggeration of the wounds. When we received the body, there were other, other things that, that were unusual. The tracheotomy that we were told it was a tracheotomy in the throat, very unusual, even for an emergency trach. Why is that? Well, first of all, I'd never really seen a trach that was done horizontally and I've never seen a trach that was that large. It also had some ragged edges. Dr. Perry said that he actually had done that trach over a, a wound. His description of the trach wound that he did was, was what you normally would, would expect. Uh, but if you did a trach that, that was that wide, you would you would probably never do it because in that area you, you, there would be a danger of damaging the thyroid. So you wouldn't, uh, it, it wouldn't be, even as an emergency trach, you wouldn't want to, want to create more damage. And especially in this situation when you wouldn't want to damage one of the primary uh, life supporting organs. That and the wound in the, uh, in the head the only other wound that I actually saw was the one in the back, and it was it was in the upper back, uh, at the upper border of the scapula. But this is that's the wound that w that was on the on the head itself. The wound wasn't obvious as to the extent of it and the margins and so forth until the scalp was actually reflected back from it. And when the scalp was reflected back, some of the bone that was adhered to the scalp had fallen off of it, made it look larger than it really was. And I think that's the measurement that's in the official autopsy. So when you saw the brain, because you know the conspiracy is it's not just one bullet, the magic bullet, whatever you want to call it, uh, and there's shots from the front not just from the back, it's not just Oswald. And by the way, no one's saying Oswald didn't shoot and he wasn't one of the shooters. They're right. just saying that there may be somebody from the front as well that shot. There's six or seven shots. What's your thoughts on that from what you saw? If in fact Oswald did shoot from the depository, the, the wound that, that was in the back that I saw was not a fatal wound. The wound that I saw in the right temple. And that couldn't have been Oswald? No, no, it couldn't have. It would have had to have come from, from actually the right front. Because and and would, you're certain about that? I'm, yeah, I saw the wound. Uh, Dr. Humes and Dr. Fink found the wound. Now, you examined this whole area of the back? Yes, sir. Were there any other wounds except one at the base of the neck and one up in the skull? No, sir, there were not. About the, the head wound? Yes, sir. There was only one? It was only one entrance wound in the head, yes, sir. Now, can you be absolutely certain that the wound you described as the entry wound was in fact that? Yes, indeed we can. So let me, let me ask you this. When you see everybody on TV, every news, everybody from TV saying it's from back, at that moment when this happened, you're there in the room, every conversation, you go to dinner, lunch, friend, people, co-workers, how are you holding yourself back from saying they're lying? That's not the case. It, it, I guess it goes back to the same thing, credibility. You didn't think they would believe you if you yeah, said anything. Right. I, I really don't want to be critical, but there are some really fine uh, researchers out there. They, uh, they've done a fantastic job. 
and have dedicated most of their life to them. They don't readily accept the possibility that, that they could be incorrect. Everything that is new or contradictory to their theories, so forth, is automatically rejected. I would be, I, you know, I would be more than willing to participate in a objective legal inquiry where, where you would be able to, you know, uh, someone who's objective, not, and I'm not talking about a group of physicians to, to review the evidence and that type of situation. I'm talking about a true law enforcement objective investigation into a murder. Why do you think it hasn't been done yet, though? Well, I'm not sure that it can be done. Why do you say that? I think the assassination of Oswald eliminated that possibility. And I think it was, they wanted to keep, and this is all my opinion, okay? I'm not, I have no inside information or anything. I think they wanted, they wanted to keep it within the realm of control of the government. You know how sometimes when me and my wife go and let's just say a name comes up that's her father's name and her father passed by say are you thinking about your dad or you know how you go some places and for me something comes up about Iran and Khomeini and the Shah she asks hey are you okay I'm sure JFK came up many times was there ever like babe what do you think about this Jim you okay was there uh, ever those moments or she just respected and says, look, if you don't want me to go there, I'm not going to go there? Well, actually, uh, since I started writing the book, uh, she's become more involved. It's and, important to know you've been, you guys have been married for 55 years and three months. You got married August of 63, which was three years before the assassination. So you're celebrating. No, no, no. It was actually the August before the assassination. The August before the assassination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was referencing. So 55 years you've been married? Mm -hmm. 55 years you've been married. This is maybe going a little bit uh, uh, deeper uh, myself, and I'm just curious to know uh, what you think about it. What, what is your opinion on Humes yourself? Do you have an opinion on Humes? I think of Humes and Boswell and Fink. They were good people. But one of the things that, that everybody seems to to negate is the fact is that they were military. They were in the, in the Navy, they were all career officers. They were getting close to their retirement. My feeling is that they were given a scenario and they were directed to actually support that through the autopsy findings. Now, I don't think that set well with Dr. Humes. He, he really wasn't that kind of an individual, but he had no alternative. And that's one of the reasons I say that the autopsy, a lot of the autopsy report is a spin on what we actually saw. Uh, the measurement of the wounds, uh, 13 uh, centimeters, that's almost five inches. That's, that's almost inch and a half over what, what I actually saw. Now, as a caveat, caveat to that, I would like to say, you know, I didn't measure the moon, but he did. But, but what I think he used, and then Dr. Boswell actually said uh, in his, his notes that it was 19 centimeters. And I think what they did was that the measurement was taken after the, the scalp was refracted. Some of the bone had separated from the scalp and fallen in, so it, it had increased the size of the wound. Uh, that was actually missing, where it, where it seemed to be bone was missing. Were they being ordered? Oh yes, I'm sure. It's and no from all the way from the top? Oh, I'm sure. So then, so then, what's your opinion on Lyndon Johnson? Not very well. I figured. Uh, wow, that was the entire question I wanted to ask you today. I was in San Antonio, and uh, I lived in San Antonio, and Lyndon Johnson in San Antonio, or in Texas, was, uh, I guess you could say, a good old boy. Politically, he was supported. He's not someone that you'd want to invite to dinner. You know, it's amazing. I'm reading a book right now. I just finished a good friend of mine wrote Robert Greene, and he talks about Lyndon Johnson heavily. 
Oh, yeah. And he talks about how uh, ambitious he was to the point where he was willing to do anything at all cost to make it to the next level in his career. And how coming up for him, he would go against Hubert Humphrey, you know, the Triple H, right. Hubert Humphrey. And then he had this one mentor of his, Russell, that kind of calmed him down and he tried to keep his motivation in. And uh, when you read about him, there's a little bit of animosity as towards JFK and the amount of love he got. because he, A lot of animosity. A lot of animosity because he was never a great orator. And he was never loved like JFK was loved. And he was way more ambitious it was way more important for him to become a president than JFK because in JFK's family, his older brother was supposed to be President mm -hmm. Joseph. Right. And you know this because if you read history, the older brother was in war, he died as a pilot, and his father was depressed for several years. And so when you read this, the part as I get deeper into this, a lot of things make sense. You know, when, when, you, when you tie it up, a lot of things make sense. Do you think a part of the investigation that uh, is to be done do you think there needs to be him involved in it as well? Or no, you're thinking more specifically from researchers? Because I think a part of this is also to see okay. two things. One, you know the six soldiers that saw the casket coming in early, right? You, 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 there was a couple E4s, a couple E5s, and an E6 that later on became a lieutenant. So either they're lying, which why would they? They're not being monetized. Why would they say that they didn't see it? And then the other side is... You know, why wouldn't they tell the truth? And then the opposite side is, what is the motive behind wanting to take the front bullet wounds out? What would be the motive? So would you say Lyndon Johnson would need to be a little bit investigated to see there was a motivation there well, as well? I, I would say, I, I guess I can answer that with a question. Who were the two people in the government at the time that benefited the most? Him and Hoover. That's right. Is that the right answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just got the chills all over my body. Yeah. It and goes deeper than that, by the way, because you have to go like five steps prior to him and Hoover. On why Hoover, so the story goes back of Kennedy's running. Um, I'm going to go a whole different angle here, and, and, and I'm curious to know what you're going to say here. Kennedy's running, and Kennedy's having a hard time with Illinois. And there's a mayor, Cook County, who helps with the seven to 8,000 people. This is some conspiracy who were dead, but he helps. And that mayor who won, won because a Chicago mob boss apparently helped him out. And the mayor's son, who was, became a late mayor later on, they asked him, was a mob ever involved in helping you? So then you go to Chicago, right? And Chicago, you go to the mob that's trying to get JFK to become president. After JFK ends up winning, he didn't need Illinois, but he ended up winning Illinois as well. He won single-handedly over Nixon, okay? So then that happens. And when that happened, uh, the mob always had Hoover not say that there is the mob. There's no such thing as the mob. And Hoover never said it. J. Edgar Hoover never said it. But because the mob had some insider information on Hoover that Hoover didn't want to become public. And I, I think you may know what some of those things may be. At that time, it was a big deal. And so when this whole thing is taking place, Lyndon's extremely ambitious on what he wants to be. Fastest way to become a, you know, they say the fastest way to become a millionaire is to marry one. And the fastest way to become a president is to be a vice president who eliminates a president. Now, again, this is all stuff that I read and I research. And then you find out why he waited by the plane, Air Force One, you know, why uh, years later, when Jackie did a recording that the tapes was there and they found and they looked at Jackie Kennedy's recording, why did she say Lyndon was a very dangerous man? She always feared him because she always felt like he wanted to do something to, to John. And so when you put all these pieces of puzzle together and why when the commission came out, is it the Warren Commission when it came out, why would he say 75-year seal why not 30 years? Because that's the typical number. Why would we do 75 years? Well, the enlisted would be dead, so no one would be able to investigate these guys. All these things are a little bit too much for someone to say, there's something here we're dealing with. Yeah, and, you know, even after the House Select Committee, my deposition and Paul's deposition was sealed again for another 50 years. <laughs> and... Uh, it was only released because of the uh, Record Review Board. There's so much involved in this, and 
One of the things that I've tried not to do is to speculate. Now, at the end of the book, I a little bit. I, I do. Yeah. And and you know, I've had people say, well, you know, and 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 I guess I have to defend. I guess I have to defend the doctors. If you were looking at a, a retirement and you had a family, uh, you'd spent all your life, you know, in uh, one organization, one company, or something of that nature, and something came and threatened your retirement and your pension, and even uh, possibility of uh, jail time. And you were told, well, you really don't have to lie about it, but you have to adjust it, uh, what, you, what you know, to fit this scenario. Narrative. Yeah. Were you told that? Uh, I wasn't. I was just, I mean, I was too low on the, on the totem pole. To, I was but just, Humes, Boswell, and, and they may have been because they I'm were sure close they to were. retirement, so they yeah. had to make the right decisions for their families because uh, right. the 25, 30 years is on the line. Sure. Makes I mean, they were, uh, they were all, I think they were 30-year people. And 30-year people, you know what happens with them. You know what I wouldn't mind doing? Why don't you and I take a break, and why don't we go to the Dealey Plaza and kind of see that, and then come back and finish the interview if you don't mind? Because if, if yeah, based sure. on what we're talking about here, I'd like to see what you think the other angle would be if it was shot, where would it be coming from? If you don't mind taking a break yeah, and going okay. to the Dealey Plaza. So that's the X right there. So Jim, if that's the X and the shot from Oswald came from there and you're looking at the brain, we would have to assume the other shot that you saw in the front would come from where? Uh, if we're standing there, probably um, right there. Somewhere around there. Because actually the shot was in the temple, exited here. Temple, hit the temple, yeah. got in, it. Right uh, a little bit above and in front of the ear, right in the hairline, that's, that was the first wound and then it, it exited back here and that's why he kind of shook back and he went back yeah and see the thing about it is that the wound that they they mentioned in the autopsy and so forth in the back of the head is an entry wound i never saw that you never saw that no i should have seen it because i handled the body for the x-ray actually placed uh the, the film cassettes for uh custard what does this do for your own level of curiosity being here? Does it do anything for you? Um, not really. I, uh, I mean, I always wanted to come down uh, and see it. It's, it's a lot smaller than I I, I, I see thought. it as well. Yeah, that's right. It's a place now. People all over the world come here to see this X. There's a throat wound probably would have come from right. Over the bridge? Probably right, right off of the railroad up there. Or it could have come from individual see where those people are standing this group or the ones in the, the back group, the group right yes here, to the left where the guy is with the camera it could have come from there in one of the photographs in the book the neck wound you can see in the right side of the neck wound where there's a ragged area mm -hmm. to the top if you look closely in, you can also see that there is a a ridge or tunnel under the skin that goes upward so what was that the, the, are you saying that's another bullet uh, I think that's probably the, the one that Dr. Perry described. I think it was removed. Because, see, the one in the back never penetrated the pleural cavity. And Humes could actually probe it with his little finger. But there was no wound. There was no bullet. Or... You said he went in, what, a, a, an inch, an inch and a half with his finger? Uh, little finger. With his middle, with his pinky? With his little finger. Yeah, wow. but Humes had huge hands. But he did. It, it actually, it never penetrated the the chest cavity or the pleural cavity uh, apparently did make a bruise on the lung because on, the, on the, the back side of the middle lobe of the right lung, just above the, the middle lobe on, on the first lobe, there was a kind of a reddish spot there that we saw. They moved it up to the top of the lung. Yeah, they also moved the wound in the back from the area where it was to the neck wound. And all of that was to support the single bullet theory. So l let me ask you, can you put a number to how many 
bullets you think there was shot or no? Just what you oh, saw I, with the I brain. Don't know. You wouldn't I, be able to know I that. I can tell you, when I left the morgue at yep. night, I, I saw at least two wounds that I thought were, uh, that I knew were wounds. Uh, I wasn't aware of the neck wound because we had been told it was a, it was an emergency trach and to leave it alone. Got it. And uh, that, that was, those were the only two wounds I saw. I never saw the supposedly entry wound in the back of the head. And in reality, if there had been an entry wound there, where they located it, it would have been within the big wound in the back of the head where all this stuff was missing. It would have had to have been either on the margin of it or whatever. And I didn't, I didn't see that. And then the pictures that they show, honestly, I believe that was, that was government misinformation. It's inconceivable to me that, that Fox would have had possession of those. They've been so tight on everything else. Everything's been just totally locked away. And all of the real evidence that was given to Robert Kennedy, and apparently he disposed of most of it. There's just too many questions. Well, so you're saying there's nothing really can happen for there to be an open investigation now, right? You said I don't think that, that the government will allow it because they, there's so much stuff that they still have sequestered that they won't release. And what we were hoping Trump wouldn't be involved in all of this to the point and he would release it, but, and he did, he released a lot of it. But the thing about it is it wasn't significant stuff. It wasn't significant stuff. It was not, it, it, it had nothing to do really with the autopsy. What's the biggest worry with it? Is the, is the worry and the concern that if comes out that it was an inside job, it's gonna show the rest of the world a level of instability you know, a level of unstable government internally? I don't think that that's the case. I, you know, when the Founding Fathers established the country, they didn't establish a House of Lords. Now we have a House of Lords, which is Congress. So I, I think it's, it's a CYI. CYA, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. See, because I... I believe that. Yeah, I believe it too. And I investigated a, uh, an attorney general or a assistant attorney general and they subpoena him and he just ignores it. How is that possible without repercussions? Of course, Johnson said it was because the people couldn't handle the right information or the, what really happened. I think it's, it goes further than that. But that's, again, too, that's my, you know, that's my take on it. And that's speculation on my part. And what you notice with him, he was loved around the world. You know, a lot of countries around the world started museums on behalf of his name because of the level of admiration they had for him. So I think that's probably why there's such a high level of wanting to know exactly what happened. What was the motivation behind it? Well, I think that uh, he was one of the first people in a long series of presidents that actually was beginning to look at the people as people. Power, who's in charge, whether it's Republican, Democrat, yep. or me or you. Yep. you know? And that's, that's, all is, that's all politics in this country has become. It's power. They buy them. They buy, it's easy to buy them nowadays. It's a money game. And you wonder, you, you go and see who can be bought and who can't be bought. And, you know, the voters sitting there saying, I like this guy, but it's not as much as you like in the voter. There's too much of that. Uh, like you said, corporations are coming in and are able to buy votes. And whether they want to do something that has to do with regulation or making it difficult for their competitors to do something, they're not looking at the political side. They're looking at more regulations that's going to hurt competition. Let, let me ask you, did you ever, did you spend a lot of time studying Oswald or not really? His background, you know, him wanting to be a Russian citizen no, no. and all that stuff or no? I really don't know, you know. People ask you, do, you, do I think he, he killed Kennedy? Well, that's actually not a finding uh, question. Because if he shot at Kennedy and he shot from behind Kennedy, then what he did, he was, he was apparently responsible for the back wound, which was not a fatal wound. and would not have been a fatal wound. You're certain of that, that it wouldn't have been fatal? Him no, shooting. no. I, and you saw that back wound? Yes. What would have been worst case with that? They would have done surgery and he would have recovered? Oh, no. It, it, they probably would have just uh, removed the bullet and, and closed it. I mean, it wasn't destructive in, in the sense that it hit a vital organ or it, it hit, even broke a rib. The whole information, the whole report that are out there, uh, the autopsy report and so forth, they don't make sense from a medical standpoint, from an anatomical standpoint, they just don't make sense. It's almost like they've been uh, manipulated or spun. The, real, the information is to lead someone to a conclusion that's not the truth. Is there anybody out there that um, is coming from the right place, morals, values, character, integrity that is 
extremely motivated to want to investigate this and uh, want to do something about it? Is there someone you know that's out there wanting to get deeper in this topic or no? If this is ever going to have a legal solution and so forth, it's going to have to come through the government and because they're the only one who can release the evidence. What evidence is still there? And see, we still don't know. You know, I'm not allowed to see photographs that I was there when they were That's was amazing. Taken. That amazes me. I'm not allowed to see the x-rays that I took part in. How is that even possible? That amazes me. Are any of those guys, the enlisted guys, uh, uh, even Dennis or O'Connor, are any of them still in contact with you? Are they still around? They're no longer alive. Humes, Boswell, are any of them still around? No. Nope. And that's what Lyndon wanted, because he knew once everybody was gone, there's nothing that's going to come back. That's right. Wow. That's right. And what year was the 50 years put on you? Oh, it was 75. 75 to 2025. That's amazing. And by the way, they measured it. They said, you know, is this uh, one of the things about Oswald is how long the distance was. They said uh, uh, they, they brought 12 marksmen to test shooting it. While a uh, target is moving, 12 out of 12, they all hit the target. So it said it's not a target that really needs somebody to be a you know, sniper to be able to hit it. It wasn't that difficult of a target to hit. But uh, Oswald himself is an interesting character. And Ruby died as well two years later. So he's not even around for somebody to be investigating and say, what are you connected to as a local nightclub owner or restaurant owner? Well, you know, my opinion, if Oswald had lived, they would have had to have had a legal trial. If the administration did reach out to you to want to go deeper on this, would there be an interest on, on your end or no? Sure. But I only have the information that I have. There's always an interest with this. So maybe if the right person sees this message, they're able to reach out and billions of people, this is not millions, billions of people would like to know what happened here. There's too many unknowns that are not fully answered yet. And there's too many signs from credible sources that makes you question things. Well, I agree also. I'd like to know who, what, where, and why. I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever know. but. It would be, you know, it would be something I really would like. Well, you never know. You never know what happens. The, the part about you is, from me, on why I wanted to do this, because Bill contacted me and says, Pat, you know, let's try to see if we can do something with you and Jim. I'm in the business of reading people because that's what I do for a living. I run a business. I'm supposed to see who I'm doing business with and what I do for a living. There's nothing about you with a motive to monetize and use this as a platform to make a multi-million dollar contract, book, any of that. You come across as somebody that you're just trying to get to the bottom of it and investigate it because there's some unknowns and 50 plus years later, you've agreed to kind of talk about it a little bit more than before. And so, I don't know, I think there's something there. The purpose of the book is to get the information out there. You know, I guess it has to do with my own mortality. It's just absolutely unconscionable that what's being taught in schools now it's not true, but it's accepted as part of history. Someone once said that history is written by the winner, and we definitely lost in this. You hear the other one, whoever controls the present controls the past. Some say whoever controls the present controls the future, right? That's true. It says a lot. Well, in fact, this was great to kind of see the perspective of something was to happen, which angle would it come from? Without being able to stand out there, it would be impossible, but I can, I can tell you the angle from the wound in the back, it actually went down at about a 30, 45 degree angle. Like oh, like this? Yeah. From the front? No, from the back. Was he like this when he got shot or was he straight? Because he was he was I, going like this and then he got I shot. I think he got shot first in the throat. And that's what his hands came up for. What he did was he, his hand came up, he went down like this and then he went back like this. And this, this is the shot. And you can see the tissue and stuff out here. And people say, oh, well, half his brain was blown out. They don't understand that a brain is a very delicate type thing. Once it's protected by the meninges and, and, the, and the skull, there would have been a lot of liquidification, or a lot of liquid that, that was because of the pressure of the bullet. As the bullet entered, it created pressure within the, in the skull cavity, and he fractured all of the side. And then where it exited, it blew it, the bone out. But as it passed through, it created pressure in, in the brain and it's kind of like, you've seen demonstrations of people shooting watermelons. Yes, yes, uh, I mean, we just had, we just shot, it's interesting, we were, we were at a place called Drive Tanks two weeks ago and I was on a tank, we were shooting stuff up. 
and I was shooting at watermelons and a uh, few pumpkins. And I shot the pumpkin, and the front is just a hole, but the back is a blast, right? And the gentleman comes up to me and says, the best thing is, he says, this is the front, this is the back, this is the front, this is the back. He says, if you want to know exactly what this means, it's what happened with JFK. It's the same exact analogy you use. I believe that. So look, if you're somebody who follows history, I'm sure you're fascinated about what we just saw here at the uh, Dealey Plaza. I am myself as somebody who was in the military. But, you know, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, uh, Jim, is obviously we're at the end here and, and the book that you wrote with William Law at the cold shoulder of history. Why don't you take a, a minute and tell us a little bit about what I'm going to get as a reader if I read this book. I think you will get a different perspective on the whole uh, JFK assassination. These are my memories of what I actually participated in concerning the brain. Dr. Boswell and I did, did the uh, body proper and what I observed from Dr. Humes and, and Dr. Fink's examination of the head. We actually took three sets of x-rays. I actually helped Gerald Custer, who was the x-ray tech, place the cassettes and move the body and so forth for the first set of x-rays. Uh, he took them and when he came back, he brought an assistant with him. I think it'll, it'll give the reader some thought, but it also is going to require the reader to make some judgments on its own. It's gonna make you go and say, well, really, let me go look it up. No right. way, and, and let me go Google it, which I think it's great by the way, I actually think that's a great thing. Yeah, that's the purpose. Uh, and I think that book does that. If you're interested in that topic, you, your parents, your kids, anybody, uh, I'd go get the book, gift it for somebody, click on the link below to go buy the book. And if you haven't watched the interview I did with Clint Hill, uh, it was an interview done about two years ago or so, click on the link over here, or we're gonna put the link for the interview as well down here, uh, uh, Clint Hill. I suggest you go watch that as well. With that being said, Jim, thank okay. you so thank much you. for coming out, thank truly. You. Thank you for your time and Thanks thank for you for your courage, for wanting to open up and yeah. tell the story, and as well as your service.